Good morning, church. Look, uh, probably for a little over eight years of my life, I had one missing tooth, and it was the front tooth. And so when I had my uh, family connections fix my tooth, I uh, then can't stop smiling. So, so I try and smile a while, so it leaves it in your heart. This week, um, yeah, oh, last week, end of last week, we, a few of us here, and Pastor Neil's here as well, uh, you know, we've experienced death in our families, and um, it's never an easy journey, um, and particularly in the Samoan culture, we have this, and, I, and many other Polynesian, and I just learned the Irish as well, do exactly the same thing, that we have an open casket brought to the family home where it stays there for the next 40, 48 hours where we just sit, sing, laugh, cry, talk as if the person was still present with us. Um, and then on the third day, we um, lay our family members to rest. And uh, growing up, um, it was a cool thing because we just found that we could hang out with our cousins, eat lots of Samoan food, which is always good. Um, but um, it was a time of fellowship, Grief and joy. Um, today's sermon is on game day. And I chose this particular name because I was, trying, I was wrestling with it. Pastor Andrew gave me this topic. I was like, hmm, how do I speak about this? But you know what? It's God that's going to be lifted in this place. And it's him who you are going to see and not me. So I chose game day. I've played a lot of team sports in my life. From basketball to rugby to a bit of soccer, yes, a bit of soccer, my body. Um, and during all that time, we had to go through a season which we called preseason. And uh, this preseason was to shape us, uh, trim us down from all our Christmas uh, excess weight. <clears throat> and um, during this process, you go through these excruciating exercises. So then you could be mentally, not only mentally, but also physically prepared uh, for what we had chosen to do. And, um, and so as we're going through this preseason, we have to look at sacrificing things because that is part of the discipline or the choice that we have made in pursuing something that we enjoy. And in this case, it was rugby league. And so when I pursued that, you had to sacrifice things and you, had to, and you had to trim off other things that didn't need to be there, that wasn't going to contribute to your success with your team and also the success of the club. And so on game day, even on game day, you'd look at it and you'd come as prepared as possible. You can be mentally prepared, physically prepared, emotionally prepared, but you get to game day and everything can just get chaotic. And you can try and revert back to processes that you went back, and it's just, it, it's, a, it's a challenge. It is a wrestle when it comes to game day. And so we have to default back to our main and our ultimate goal, and that was our purpose of being there. Some of us were paid. Some of us were doing it because we just loved the sport. And so today... This is a snapshot of what we're going to talk about. It's a preseason is necessary in our lives. Discipline requires sacrifice and commitment. And on game day, are you all in? Whether the tides change, are you still, do you still remain faithful on game day? We're going to be, if you have your Bibles with you, if you don't, that's okay. But there is some Bibles at the back of our churches, our church here, um, if you'd like one. But we're going to be reading from Mark chapter 8, verses 31 and 38, up until chapter 9, verses 1. So if you have it, just give me an amen. Amen. Thank you. 
And I'm going to read. In verse 31 of chapter 8. He began to teach them and said, and uh, he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. I'm in verse 33. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny himself or themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me, for the gospel, will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when it comes when he comes in his father's glory with his holy angels. And he said to them in, ver- in chapter 9, verse 1, Truly I tell you, some, of, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God has come with power. When we look at verses 31 to 33, in the previous verses, Jesus had just healed a blind man in, in verses 22 of uh, Mark chapter 8. And he asked the blind man, <clears throat> what do you see? The blind man said, I see, but I see trees. And then Jesus healed him again, and he could see. When we look at this particular, those three verses of chapter 31 to 33, The disciples really didn't understand what he was talking about. Why the Son of Man had to suffer. Here in Isaiah 53 verse 5, this is where the disciples' mindset was. In terms of, this, this is not the suffering servant that the prophet Isaiah was talking about, is it? The word Messiah is a word that brought joy that brought freedom in the eyes and the eyes of the disciples. So why would Jesus be talking about this? Why would he say to his disciples, teaching them that he must suffer? Yesterday I was at my Bible study group with my bro Lee, and we just stuck on the word must. That Jesus, that he must suffer. And we discussed that there's a challenge when you try forgiving someone that's done so much pain and so much hurt in your life. And so when you forgive someone, someone has to incur that debt. And it's generally the person that's forgiving the other. And here Jesus is teaching his disciples that he must suffer. It's a must, because if he does not do this, would we have an opportunity for salvation? He continued on, and he listed so many different things. He must suffer, he must be rejected, by the teachers of the law, by the Pharisees. And this is the, I think this is what I think is the Trump when he goes that he must be killed and, ro- and risen again. Now I'm going to go with boldness. 
and said, are you, willing, are you at this point willing to die for the gospel? Are you at a position in your life where if it comes to game day, are you going to, be, are you going to remember your purpose and why you're sitting in these pews today? Why you've followed our Savior? Because as I was saying in the kids' story, we have this coach, and Jesus is this coach who's trying to coach us in a direction that will give us success. And sometimes as a coach, it is very hard to try and implement things if those that he's coaching don't want to listen or don't follow. Or they have their own perceived ideas, like here in, in, um, as disciples. And again, in Isaiah 53 verse 5, the disciples had a, had a mindset that this, this is not the suffering servant that Isaiah was saying. And it reads, it goes, but he, is, he was pierced for his, our transgression. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds we are healed. He carries on in, in verse 6. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us have turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquities of us all. Again, he must suffer. He goes on to verse 32. <laughs> There's a crack up. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Now, the same rebuke used here is the same rebuke that Jesus used to cast out demons. So it was a pretty solid rebuke. And as it continues on verse 33, Jesus turned, looked at this Peter, looked at his disciples and rebuked Peter. Satan, get behind me. Now, I don't know <clears throat> about you, but growing up in a Samoan church in New Zealand, in South Auckland, Whatever the pastor said, went. So if the pastor told my parents we need to go clean the windows on a Wednesday, guess what the whole family of 26 was doing? Cleaning the windows. And no one will ask why. There's this element of my upbringing that I grew up to now, and I'm... Talk to Pastor Andrew. I wrestle with that from time to time because even today I'm like, <clears throat> all pastors I see, hey, Pastor. I don't say their name. I just, hey, Pastor. Hey, how are you? Thank you. Like, it's because it's this reverent thing. We've been, we've been taught or we've been set by examples from our parents that they are the appointed people of God. And so we need to give them that beneficial, that benefactor, and that respect. And here, Peter goes, hey, what are you doing, mate? He rebuked Jesus. He goes, why are you talking like this? Don't you know that if you go to the cross or if you die, what does it mean for us as disciples? They couldn't grasp that understanding. And as I made reference to the blind man, they had this blue vision. They were still seeing a little bit of vision of what Jesus' purpose was on earth. Because they were still distorted by what they perceived as who the Messiah would be and what, would the, and what the Messiah would do on earth. And that Messiah was to come and recorrect the Romans and lift the Jewish nation back to the top. And from my studies, is, that's not what happened. Jesus came to turn the culture of the world upside down. In order for you to be first, you need to be last. So Jesus continued talking to the disciples, and he was talking to Peter. 
He said, Jesus knew that there was a spiritual force behind what Peter was saying. And so he, Jesus, spoke directly to that. And he said, get behind me, Satan. You do not understand what my Father has given me. In Matthew chapter 4, verse 10, it says, Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. During this time, he just, he just got baptized. Jesus got baptized from his cousin, his family affair. He went into the wilderness and he was tempted by Satan. So during this process, he, Jesus remembered that Satan wanted to make sure that Jesus' preseason was very tough. He wanted to discourage him. And just like footy, when we're running, I remember when we get there, we have to run 1.2 kilometers, and we have to do it under five minutes. Now, as an individual that's 127 kilos, under five minutes is not achievable for us. But we had to go through that because our coach could see that we needed to go through this process for the success, the successful plan. And so here, Jesus is tempted and he reminds Satan and goes, away from me, Satan. And this is related to our, our verse when he says in verse 33, get behind me, Satan, for you do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. And how many of us today, church family and visitors, how many of us are get caught up in our man-made ideas? We study hard, we work hard, we play hard. And so in our mindset, we start to cultivate this culture that, yeah, how, how much of that do I need to give to God? And how much of that do I need to do myself? You know, I wrestle with that. I wrestle with the concept of how much should I give to God? That's a big wrestle. As many of you know, I am a second slash almost third year uni student at Avondale University. <laughs> yo, yo, Avondale represent. I'm also a father of two. And I do little various things around our, our community here on the Central Coast. I was sitting down with my mentor yesterday, uh, and he said to me, Grant, you need to let go and let God take ministry because it's his church, not my church. And that's why I wrestle with as a man, as, as man made all the cultures of society, <clears throat> isn't there a point where we should intervene in terms of how or what God has blessed us with to share? And that's why I sit in the wrestle. Because as a follower of God, if I get jammed up or I get stuck, I should leave it up to Him. But I get caught up and the noise, because it's what's in front of me, particularly when it affects my family. Oh, when that noise happens, oh my gosh. Next level, right? So here, Jesus reminds Satan, Oi, you have no idea what my dad just told me. So get behind me and watch. Watch me. As we move on to verse 34, it goes, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross. In those days, the cross symbolized death. The Romans used it as an authority power to remind every single nation in the known world that if you mess with us, this is what's going to happen to you. 
And Jesus used that symbol and taught that symbol to his disciples and those around the crowd that was there because they knew what the cross meant. But they just couldn't swallow the concept of dying for the gospel. And so it says in 34, if you want to follow me, you need to deny and take up your cross. I asked the question earlier, are you ready to die for the gospel? All around the world we hear of different stories. And as a community here on the Cinch Coast, we pray earnestly. We pray continuously for all our community of faith around the world that is suffering. For me, I know I'm very comfortable here. But I go through my own preseason, just like many others. We go through our different preseasons in life. Preseasons where it stretches us, challenges us, molds us, shapes us, creates a new me. And when I decided to follow God, that I knew the cup I was drinking from. And I even went further to go and study at Avondale and become a pastor. Oh my gosh, what is going on? When people view us as ministers or followers or disciples or leaders of our community, they go, we're down in Melbourne and 95% of my family are not, they don't go to church, that's okay. Every time there was a prayer that needed to be saying, hey, where's the pastor? I was like, oh, here we go. And now you want to acknowledge my pastoring, eh? But those were those moments. Those were those game day moments that God goes, look, I'm continuously shaping you through your preseason so you can go back to your own family home and they can acknowledge that you are not only a pastor, but a follower, a true follower of God. So any event, last minute events, what happens? We're at the family service, and they get up and say, Grant, can you do a speech? I'm like, I'm ready, let's go. I wasn't ready, but let's go anyway. Because it's in those moments, and it doesn't have to be big moments. It can be the little moments where you walk down the road, you chuck a smile, your Colgate smile, you know? That could change the direction. That could change the mood of an individual. And here Jesus says, in order for you to follow me, you need to take up your cross. Don't talk it. Walk it. And as followers of God, as Adventists, there's the wrestle. Are you willing to take up your cross all the way to the end? Joshua chapter 24, verse 15. This guy just took over Moses in the scriptures. And he wanted to remind the children of Israel And it says here, but if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourself this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of your ancestors served beyond the Ephrates or the gods of the Amorites, in whose land you are living in. But as for me and my house, what does it say there, church? We will serve the Lord. Even in the OT scriptures, Old Testament, sorry, this Aussie thing, just shortening everything. Even in the Old Testament, Joshua, Moses, Samuel, David, Ruth, all these people knew. They wrestled? Of course they wrestled. Were they human? Yeah, they were. Joshua wanted to make the stand then and there. Okay. I'm with God. Are you be with me or you're against me? So, and, and Joshua made that stand. 
And like it says in verse 34, take up your cross. If you want to be a follower, take it up. Follow me. Joshua made that decision as well. Today, me and my household, we will serve the Lord. As we continue... To read, it goes, for whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me in the gospel will save it. Was it good for one man, for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? In Mark chapter 10, verses 21, talks about the rich young ruler. How he did everything by the books, take the boxes. And then Jesus said this. He looked at him and loved him because he knew he was wrestling with this one thing. He knew. One thing you lack, he said, go and sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. Not long ago, we did a Sabbath quarter on stewardship. Does this mean that we go sell everything we have? (laughs) My opinion, no. But if that one thing is stopping a growing relationship with you and God, get rid of it. And that's what Jesus was saying here to the rich young ruler. You take all the boxes. But do you feel it in here and in here? What is hindering you from a fulfilling relationship with Jesus? That is what I need you to do. And if your riches is hindering you from doing that, there's a lot of homeless people around here on the Central Coast. There's a lot of people doing it tough. I know our church is a giving church. I definitely know that. I've been here for almost two years now. I definitely know we are a giving church, giving of our time, our resources, our buildings. We are definitely a giving church. But Jesus was speaking into the fact that if that is hindering you from a growing relationship with God, see you later, mate. Get rid of it. And so Jesus continued to teach his disciples What is good as a man to gain the whole world but loses his soul? It's no point. I've been to funerals where no one believes in God. It's painful. I've been to funerals where there's hope in the coming of Jesus Christ. And it's joyful. I remember right at the end of my my auntie's service, my cousins, as they do last-minute things, Cuz, can you do the final prayer? I said, yeah, sure, no worries. I got you. And they go, hold on. We're just going to play Auntie's ferret song. And I'm thinking, all right, it's going to be a nice, slow gospel, Gaither vocal band, heritage singer sort of song. So I'm like, yes, yeah, sweet. That will conclude the service. We get up on stage, and they play the Vinger Boys. And it was sha la 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 throughout the whole three minutes and 50 seconds. And everyone was dancing on stage. It, and I just went, wow. And I said to my cousins, I go, how am I meant to close with prayer after this? And they go, you got this. God will speak through you. And I went, yum. That is very good. What a good is a man to gain the world and lose his soul. Church, this is a little snapshot reminder so you can take home, digest it, do whatever you want with it. Jesus had to suffer. Jesus had to suffer for our salvation. He bore the cross so that you and I can, have, can accept him and receive eternal life. 
He didn't need to. He didn't need to sacrifice leaving the glory of his home to be born here to redeem. He didn't need to do that, but he did because he loves each and every one of you. Discipleship demands sacrifice and commitment. Following God requires that trimming of running 1.2 kilometers in five minutes, I mean, starting from 20 minutes and then working your way down to hopefully 10 minutes. That's the fastest I've done it. But it requires sacrifice and commitment. And when commitment comes, bro, that's a loose term these days. Commitment is a loose term. The reason why I say that, I, again, I can't, my family is massive. And commitment is not there. Commitment is it's just loose. As soon as they don't like something, they bounce to the next thing that's good. As soon as their husband or wife doesn't, boom, next one. Discipleship demands sacrifice and commitment. It's hard. It's hard, Jacko. But only through God, everything is made possible through God. And on game day, you know, even on game day, you got to play what's in front of you. And on game day, there's a, there's a player, has a number seven at the back. He's like the director of the whole team. So whatever he says goes. And us front rowers, we're just big boofs. We just run straight, target the smallest players, and that's all we do. That's our job. And I'm okay with that because I know my place. I know my lane. And I trust that our number seven knows what he's doing. And at times, he has to change, redirect. But game day is driven by your purpose. Mark chapter 14, verse 35, 36. Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane. And he said, go, he's going a little further. He fell to the ground and prayed that if possible, the hour might pass from him. Abba, Father, he said, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me, not what I will, but what you will. When you look at that snapshot, Jesus was driven by his purpose, his one and only purpose, and it was you. He knew the hardship physically, mentally, spiritually that he had to endure. That whole that preseason that he went through, he endured it. Because when it came to game day, he knew the only thing that was driving him would be his purpose for you. As a church family, we look around. If you're new to the church, welcome. I know that was all serious some from time to time. But we've got so many members here in our church who have followed and taken up the cross. Some that have passed away, still waiting for our coming Messiah to come. But they live in hope. They die in faith and in hope. Betty is, I think, is our oldest member here. Ask her. Ask her what faith looks like. Ask her what it looks like to take up your cross. So many people here. So church family, where are you today? Are you willing to die for the gospel? It's hard. It's tricky. And it slaps us in the face. But that's the reality of what Jesus was trying to teach his disciples. He was trying to get them to understand what it actually is going to take for them to be a follower of God. So church, today I'll leave you with that question. Where are you today? Again, if you're first time here, come and speak to us. We've got so many leaders in this church that could share with you their walk, their talk of who and what God has done in their lives. And may their testimonies through the Holy Spirit convince you 
to have a growing relationship with God. Amen. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for who you are. Thank you for molding, teaching, setting the example of what it's going to take to take up our cross today, Lord. And we just ask for your wisdom, your understanding, and your grace to be poured upon us. May the Holy Spirit continue to be invited into all our hearts today. And may it transform us into disciples willing to go out there and spread your love and your grace. Lord, this is our humble prayer. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.